<laughs> well, welcome to Regenerate, everyone. We're here on a special edition of Regenerate and Carbonate, talking to Patrick Holden from the UK. Here we are at 6 p.m. here in Australia time, and we're very excited to um, basically just get the goss about what's going on over in the UK in comparison to the the um, Australian version, just to, like, see what's going on. So I'm Kelly. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you for joining us tonight. And this is Helen and Mike McCosker. Yeah, hello, Patrick. And, and you asked us just before we went on air, is it called air? It's yeah. or carbon. What is it that we're living in? Yeah. I think it's carbon. <laughs> just before we went on carbon. <laughs> just wanted to know a little bit about our farm. So um, perhaps if I can share that with you, Patrick. So uh, Mike is a fourth generation farmer and um, we live in northern New South Wales and we call our, our farm heaven on earth. We live on 3,000 acres in, and um, Mike, do you want to share your, a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so we've had um, over that history of farming, which is, for me, running into sort of 35 years now, um, we started out as chemical farmers and realised that we were killing the land. And so it was a case of, of then having to relearn our trade right from scratch in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, college taught me about organic matter and the photosynthesis cycle, but when it came to actually implementing a new regenerative system, it was a long way to go. So, you know, I had somebody that, that said to me, um, you know, do you want to help other people? And I said, well, I, I don't know enough to help myself. And they said, well, you know, if you just keep reading 15 minutes a night, by the end of the year, you'll know more than most, most of the farmers. So that's where we started, you know, reading and studying everything we could on organics and biodynamics and soil biology, talking about sustainability and talking about soil biology. And now the the um, focus has gone to regenerative. And, you know, to me, it's all the same thing. We're rebuilding the health of the soil. But, um, Patrick, you've been doing some amazing stuff over there. Can you just share with us a little bit of uh, your story? Well, uh, I don't know if you heard the... Um the clock singing when we came in, but I was apologising. I've got an inherited grandfather clock, which sings a different tune every four hours, and it was doing its nine o'clock stint. So I'm sitting here um, in the office at my farm, which is in West Wales. Uh, it's around 300 acres, and we've got a dairy herd of Ayrshire cows. The Foundation uh, 30 were purchased in 1973, so we've now been here for 48 years doing our best to kind of farm in harmony with nature. We've got lots of things wrong, of course. And um, today what we're really trying to do is to produce as much food as we can from this place without diminishing the, the, the soil and the, the natural capital uh, that we have stewardship over during our very temporary occupation. And um, what is really interesting about being on a piece of land, as you will know, for a long period of time, is you can see the impact of your practices on outcomes, whether it's the soil health or whether it's the, the nature and the biodiversity which can coexist with the um, farming system. And you can then change your practices and see what happens. And I think that relationship with the land is what really fascinates me more and more because I feel as if I'm learning as I go along. You know, you mentioned regenerative farming practices. And, of course, they've become very much kind of, you know, the focus of things in the last... A few years and holistic grazing in particular mob grazing whatever you want to call it we we've kind of switched increasingly to using that system to graze our cows and i can see that when you do that the whole structure of the um the pastures changes the way in which the grass interacts with the grazing animals and i think you get more yield of grass but of course of grass and other plants but also that i think the soil carbon um the soil root mass increases as well it, correspondingly so you are actually building soil carbon and probably speeding up soil building which is what we all have to do obviously but as you will know along the road uh, when we first came here there were no organic standards so i was very much involved with kind of that organic project for about 
well, more than 25 years, drafting the standards. And then I worked for the Soil Association for over 20 years, building the organic market. And actually, I came to Australia t- twice in connection with that work. Once in 1990, where I did a kind of tour around and I spoke at a conference in Adelaide and then I went to Perth um, and to um, Melbourne and to Tasmania, where both my um, parents, grandparents grew up. So um, in Hobart and at Circular Head in Northern California, and in Northern, not California, um, Tasmania. So I have roots in Australia and I felt a little bit of a sense of coming home it's a weird thing when you come to a place where your ancestors lived, that you kind of come some sort of recognition. So that was really nice. Um, then again, I came in 2000, and then I've been a couple of times since then as well. So I think what strikes me about um, coming to a country, the other side of the world, then meeting farmers and observing what is happening, is we are all completely connected. We are stewards of soil. We are looking after water. We are managing our food production in harmony with nature and all the other impacts of our farming system unite us. And it doesn't matter whether we're farming with too much rain, as we've recently had here in West Wales, or too little, and whether our scale is small or large. It's the same thing. Macrocosm, microcosm. If you understand how to farm an acre well, then you've already got the key to farming at scale. And so here we're making cheese from the... um, the, the milk of our cows, more or less all the milk going into cheese, a single farm um, raw milk cheese called Havod, which has got an amazing following in Australia, weirdly enough. Um, and you could say, well, should we be exporting cheese to the other side of the planet? Well, who knows? But uh, we've got some great uh, followers in Australia, including um, a woman who lives in Perth, who, who stayed here as an apprentice last year. So there are a lot of wonderful connections between us. And I'm looking forward to talking to you about all the, uh, all the work that we share. My current job, day job, when I'm not here, is with the Sustainable Food Trust. This is an organization that I established around uh, 11 years ago when I left the Soil Association. And its mission is to accelerate the transition towards more sustainable food and farming systems. Um, We're working, uh, trying to influence people in leadership positions. Uh, We're advancing um, policies and um, practices which we think are part of the solution because, of course, farming's done so much damage to the planet, but it can be the opposite. And we're also trying to influence public opinion because we think all lasting change in the end will be led by informed public opinion. So if the public don't understand what to eat and how we should farm, which they don't at the moment, a lot of people don't, then we need to get that information across to them because most people are really wanting to do the right thing now. You know, I know there's a big vegan movement and personally I don't think you need to go vegan unless you have ethical objections. But if you just treat people as thirsty to want to know how they can be part of the solution, I believe that uh, the public can be our greatest asset in enabling the change that we will want to see. Yeah, Patrick, I think that we have this saying at Carbonate and we're the soil I think, <laughs> which is one of the important factors. You know, if you have a look at the soil and how important diversity is in the soil, just like our communities. And this morning we had, Mike and I had an incredible day because Damon and the 2040 team, I don't know, have you seen the film 2040? No, I haven't. Oh, it's a fantastic t- film. So it talks about all the solutions that we can do on the planet um, leading to 2040. And one of them, um, there was, I think, nearly 15 minutes of that whole film was all about regenerative agriculture. And it was w- wonderful. I think if anyone listening to this hasn't seen 2040, it's just a fantastic uh, documentary film to see. But the, is it on, uh, where is it, on Netflix? Ah. Uh, Yes, yes. It's, it's on, on Netflix. Netflix. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, of course, Kiss the Ground is okay. another one. But this yeah. morning, Damon and the 2040 team came to our farm and we had a, a beautiful conversation about, you know, what are the things, if we had a, a, 20, a, a lens of, of 2030, what would we like to see? What is it that we'd really love to see? Imagine going forward, you know, 10 years. So, um, you know, we had this fantastic conversation about well imagine if we could go to if we could go to the supermarkets and see that the labeling was all about chemicals 
any labeling was just this has got chemicals in it and all the other food just was it was just naturally going to be it was ex expected that it would be grown naturally and grown healthily so rather than the current system that that you know just allows chemicals all through the food system without having to to say you know this is poison <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Right. that would be one solution, and I think that's where we need to get towards. But the question is how we can convey this information to people who buy food in the right way. And you're using the term regenerative, and, you know, others are in this country are using the term agroecological. And, of course, I was all connected with organic and then other people with biodynamic farming. But we, what we don't want, I think, is a kind of term list war. We, we need to recognise that all these terms are describing the change that's necessary, as you said, from a more from a chemical approach to a more biological approach. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about carbon and fixing carbon back in the soil, although that's key. It's also about, you know, many other aspects of the impact of farming practice on the soil, on water, on biodiversity, on nutrient cycling and the circular economy, on crop health, on livestock health, on energy and resource use and on social and cultural impacts. And what we've been doing at the Sustainable Food Trust is trying to develop what we hope will become an internationally harmonized language for measuring farm sustainability, a, a bit like accounting protocols. So if you say, you know, you're running a business and I say, how's your P&L and your balance sheet? I need to be able to say to you, tell me about your farm sustainability imp impact and your index. So if we had this common metric, I could say, well, let's imagine there are 10 categories and each category has 10 points. That's 100. So I could say to you, well, I've got an overall score of 71. Um, I'm strong on soil. and I'm weaker on water and I'm, I must make more effort with biodiversity. And you can say to me, well, what was your soil score? Um, where were you weak or whatever? And I'd ask the same to you. And. Then we can go to the COP26 coming up in Glasgow or the next COP, which could be a COP for food. And we can set a framework for all future international trade in food, whereby if it's um, regenerative, sustainable, part of the solution will allow trade without tariffs because we're involved with this whole tariffs agreement now with, the, with Australia and the UK post-Brexit. And I've been trying to say to our Prime Minister, don't have a kind of race to the bottom agreement on trade. Yes, we can have tariff-free trade, but only if the food is produced in a sustainable way. And if it isn't, we shouldn't be trading it because it's part of the problem. And that way, you could have every country in the world signing up to this COP for food trading agreement based on this common language with sustainability assessment. And we think there's real traction in this idea. And um, is it you've got climate works, which are based based in Melbourne, I think, one of your NGOs in Australia, they they would be interested in trialling this and maybe you could work with us to trial this thing in Australia because it's, it is a universal language. And obviously, if you're looking at biodiversity impacts in Australia, you're going to be measuring different species to, to what I'm measuring here on this hill in Wales. But if you can get the right indicator species and they are proxies for overall biodiversity, we've, we've established the common language. So I think this is one way of resolving all this discussion about which term we're going to use, because we're actually all in this together, and we need to measure it together in a common way. I don't know what you think about that, but, I mean, I was the one who developed the organic standards, and are you aware of what's going on in America at the moment, where there's this real organic project, which is really exercising people and they have the new agricultural secretary there tom Vilsack, and he's a very kind of political man you know and he's obviously obviously involved with all this lobbying impacts listening to all these people who go into washington and say you cannot um uh, strengthen the organic standards because we the chicken people want to get organic chicken in from birds that never get out to pasture etc etc so he's a consummate lobbyist but if you had this thing which was a sustainability metric with universally common standards he couldn't do anything about that because i think it's rather sad that all the early organic pioneers in australia are getting so angry about the dilution of organic standards when the real problem was the line drawing exercise in the first place you know in a way you could say well 
is something organic, yes or no, you know, one side of the fence it is and the other side of the fence it isn't. In a way, that's a little bit too binary. And you're bound to have people who are complaining about the dilution of the standards on one side and people who are saying they're too high on the other. It's kind of almost an inevitable consequence of if you set a, a threshold. So I think that we could work together in this new way on a common global standard for sustainable agriculture. And it's like a stairway to heaven instead of a yes or no decision. And of course, there's, there still will be organic markets. I mean, we're organically certified here. We're the longest established organic dairy farm in Wales. And we have an organic inspection every year. You know, we have a two day person, the inspector comes virtually during COVID, of course. And the inspector is just looking to see if we cheat, really. And at the end of it, he or she hasn't found that we're cheating. So we're relieved. We're certified for another year. But do I know whether my soil is more biologically fertile and with more carbon content than last year? No, I don't, because they're not measuring it. Do I know whether my biodiversity has gone up? No, I don't, etc. So I think we need to shift to measuring impacts. And of course, then we can reward if you have a subsidy system, which we still do, you can reward positive practices. But the real thing we're trying to do is lock up CO2 in the soil. So that's the whole, you know, that's the holy grail, etc. And anyway, I'd, I'd be interested to know what you think about all that. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you that a common language is really actually quite important. In, in the past, I believe that uh, the food industry has been able to disconnect consumers from the land and from how the food is produced by, by mixing up the language and separating people from, from how the food is grown. And... Um, we know that the outcomes of that have been quite poor. And it's been this push for the cheapest food that we can produce. And that's, I believe, and we believe that that's what's driven farmers into this mode of mining the soil. You know, farmers at the moment in the industrial farming system are really mining the system. They're not, they're not maintaining and they're definitely not rebuilding the the biodiversity and the and the soil health and all of those things that are important. So there has been a big push here, and you know, aligning the language would be fantastic. We've got uh, the Wentworth Group of Scientists in Australia that have been working on the the um, natural capital accounting systems to to help put value um, to some of these ecosystem functions that farmers are, are managing all of the time. And one of the projects that we've been um, personally involved with is to develop a, um, an outcomes-based certification along the lines of what you're talking about so that now... Well, we, should, we should participate on that. <clears throat> we, should, we should collaborate on that. Absolutely. And, you know, we'd love to collaborate on that. And if we can align our language and align our processes, then that makes what we're doing truly international so that so we can't have food that's, that's really being produced by mining the system sneaking in somewhere you know and and we don't have to get into this argument of whether organic production is better or biodynamic production is better because now we're actually measuring you know the nutrient content of the food and the, the soil carbon levels that, on the farm where this food is produced and we're doing the biodiversity surveys and we're looking at the water use efficiency of the of the water cycle on the farm so those things now become you know, outcomes that we either hit or we don't hit, you know. It's, well, that uh, sounds incredibly, that sounds absolutely aligned to what we're trying for as well. So we definitely should compare notes. We will send you after this podcast um, uh, so a, a kind of progress report on the progress we've made. And it would be very interesting to see if we can, can align the two frameworks, you know, because exactly what you just described is what we are doing too. Yeah, awesome. That's fantastic. You know, I do love this regenerative world because there are a lot of people around the planet that really care about what's going on. And so they're hungry for information, good, clear, concise information about the farm where their food's grown and about the, the methods that are used there. Um, you know, one of the reasons we, we buy food is, is for nutrition and we don't want that food to, to have, you know, chemicals all through it. In fact, part of my journey was a chemical poisoning event on the farm. 
And it wasn't until my diet was actually fixed up that my food intake was was balanced and back on high nutritional food that my body actually repaired itself. So this is so interesting. Sorry, there's a time delay, but it's so interesting how so many of these uh, conversion experiences are related to health, and rightly so, because in a way, health is the great indicator of whether you've got your farming practice right, whether it's the health of the soil, the plants growing in the soil, or the livestock, or the people that eat the food. Health is what we've got to be striving for, and health is the, the best possible outcome indicator of a good system which is working in harmony with nature. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, health is, is not just the personal journey, which so many of us have had. It's also the, the society's journey as well. You know, if, if our nutrition is down, then there's been a lot of work to show that our ability to solve problems is down. Um, you know, our health care costs are a lot higher for the society. So, you know, we're really working on our our overall community health, which impacts the ability of, of our society to, do, to look after itself. So I just think this is such an important topic that we're talking about. Oh, Mike, share about the little um, step that we're building into the sixth and seventh process to do with community and our Indigenous. I love this step. It's such a great one, Patrick. It's just like an additional bonus beat. Yeah, so you know, at the start of the, the talk, we spoke about uh, oh, I'm a fourth generation farmer and that connection to the land is so important. And here we are in a country, we're actually on Gamilaroi land, and this land has been um, inhabited for 50,000 years. So talk about connection to land. That's, uh, you know, something in a scale that we as a fourth generation farmer, have no understanding of even. So in that 50,000 years, our Indigenous people have actually obviously gained a lot of wisdom about how this landscape runs. They call it, their, their uh, name for that is natural law. And so we know from practice that as we improve the ecology of the farm, and as we get everything working the way it should, we're going to be getting closer and closer to this Indigenous version of natural law and how natural law works. So um, with our, our regenerative certification, you know, we've got the, the five-star version where we're measuring the nutrient density and we're measuring the soil carbon and we're measuring the biodiversity and we're measuring the chemical, you know, if there's any chemicals used, we want to make sure there's, there's no residues left in the food. And we're measuring the water cycle efficiency on the farm. So those five things could be the five-star system. But then we want to start a discussion with the Indigenous knowledge. And so our sixth and seventh star is that the farmers are now actually talking and sharing with, with the Indigenous knowledge and then as we start to align with, with their description of what natural law actually is, that's how we gain the sixth and seventh star. And we believe that that, you know, that sort of system could work in any country around the world because there is ind Indigenous knowledge that's been very important in observing that landscape and understanding how it functions. And so as we, as we have that discussion, then we're actually really connecting to the land and we're seeing it in a completely different way. We're seeing it not only from our day-to-day -day observations, but we're seeing it through this lens of, of you know, 50,000 years of history. It brings in the sacred regeneration, which is something that I just love, that next level of what we're all doing here. I am Patrick. I haven't been a farmer, but um, I met Helen and Mike out on my little domain out in the bush and um, I came to this as an artist. So I've been really like bringing in this regenerative art movement around what carbon is, what all of our language and conversations are in relationship to this regenerative movement that's sweeping over the planet. So it's a true renaissance of human beings. It's so much more than just um, this little thing over here or this. It's just this huge shift of a renaissance and it is so powerful to watch. 
How, how are the regenerative artists doing in the UK? That's actually all I wanted to ask about. What's yeah, going on over there? <laughs> I was just, before you answer that, Patrick, I was just going to jump in there and say that, you know, we talk about this uh, renaissance of, of understanding and connection to the, to the land. And, you know, that really started in some ways with, um, with the biodynamic movement, you know, back in the, in the early 1900s. So, you know, Patrick, you'd understand that through your work as a biodynamic farmer. I missed the last bit of what you said, but um, in relation to, I think, in relation to uh, uh, the deeper aspect of the shift towards regenerative farming, there is a consciousness shift going on globally at the moment, I think, which is absolutely necessary if we are to achieve a readjustment of our relationship with planet Earth uh, in time to make the planet unlivable for a, a great section of humanity and I think you're right to bring up the connection with the spiritual and uh, the deeper laws that inform all life on the planet and arguably govern everything in the universe and I think that Rudolf Steiner when he gave his agriculture lectures I think it was in June 1924 in response to a group of East German farmers who were noticing that their crops and livestock were losing their vitality um, that he outlined an approach which, as he rightly said, does not just encompass physical change of farming, the, the chemical to the biological, but actually achieves a different relationship between the farmer and the planet and the cosmos. And so he really deeply understood, because he was a philosopher and a teacher, some of these finer energies uh, which permeate everything. And I think that in a way, the biodynamic movement, and of course you had the great Alex Pol Polinski, who did a lot of work in Australia and who I met, um, who was kind of one of the leaders of the, of the advocacy of biodynamic farming um, in the world. And we've had our own uh, people here. But what I think this is calling on us all to rethink is our relationship with nature. And another person who's done a lot of work on this front is Prince Charles. I don't know if you are aware of his book, which is called Harmony, A New Way of Looking at Our World, which he wrote about 10 years ago. I think it was maybe 11 or 12 years ago now. And when he was writing it, because I know Prince Charles, I wondered what he was on about, if you know what I mean, because he's, he's come up with a lot of new thinking in his time. Uh, but now I realise that what he was... Uh, highlighting which we all need to realize is that everything in the world is governed by common laws which are to do with the mass of things and the geometry of things and finer expressions of this uh, harmony of the universe which find expression in nature and of course on farms so my particular interest on this farm and it's been a kind of um, uh, revelation to me is to re-examine the way in which these harmony principles are manifesting here on the farm. And just to give you a few examples, one of them is, of course, the principle of the cycle. So everything is governed by cycles, especially in farming. I mean, whether it's the cycle of the year or the cycle of the seasons or the cycle of a crop rotation, seven years in our case, five years of grass and clover to build fertility and two years of cropping or the gestation of a cow or there are so many cycles, the lunar cycle. And in a way, we need to be more mindful of our relationship to these universal cycles and our interventions and the timing of our interventions uh, to harmonize with the cycles which are going to go on whether we're here or not. And it seems to me that one way to look at farming is that we have a responsibility not only to be stewards of nature and to work in harmony with nature and, as, as it were, to rediscover the wisdom of the ancients that went before us because we are literally human come lately, but also to build the vitality and the, of the landscape which we steward and at the same time to see how much food it's possible to produce without 
diminishing that vitality and indeed the opposite. How can we make our farms more beautiful, more harmonious, more uplifting of the human spirit? And of course that leads to the question of art. And I just want to tell you a little story because I believe that the farms of the future need to become educational and cultural centers. And we on this farm have a threshing barn where they used to thresh the corn. And it was probably built around 200 years ago. It's entirely built of the stone of this hill. And in fact, they ran out of stone in one quarry and then they moved to a different source of stone. And you can see that written in the walls of this place. And you can imagine that without any machinery, they worked goodness knows how long for years to get this beautiful threshing lawn in place. And while we've been here over the last tiny period of nearly 50 years, it's kind of gone into a bit of a decline. But now we've decided that we're going to uh, restore it, which we are doing. And it's going to become a place uh, where we can have educational events for farmers, but also for young pe people that come here, for children, for schools, and a place of learning and culture. And I believe that art and culture should absolutely be an integral part of, of the life of a farm. And if we are going to engage with people who live on in cities, as I did, I grew up in London, and to enable them to rediscover their relationship with nature, the place to do that is a farm. There's no doubt about that, because as the poet and philosopher Wendell Berry said, eating is an agricultural act. So we are connected with the land from which we owe our our life uh, three times a day or however often we eat and what better place to discover that connection than to be on a farm not just to do work but also to reflect and to learn from nature so i think everything you describe about art about culture about these finer energies which we are just rediscovering as you said because our ancestors already knew this this is the spirit of this time did you want to go, Mike? Kill? No, sorry. I thought, I thought Kill would be all over this with the regenerative artists and everything else there. You know? When Helen said at the start of the broadcast that um, we call our farm Heaven on Earth, one of the things that we've done is actually sit on the veranda together looking at the landscape and say, so what does heaven look like? And, um, you know, does it have a splash of colour over here on this hill? And does it have a, have a, um, a, a new tree line down there to break the wind flow? You know? So that's been one of the ways that we're personally connected to the, to the land. And it is, can, if I might say so, I think it is what you say is perfect. We are literally trying to create with our farm ecosystem, which is a sort of microcosmic reflection of the cosmos heaven on earth every farm on the planet should be yeah. striving to do exactly what you are doing to create a little ecosystem of heaven on earth where human beings are being in harmony with nature and yeah. feeling better for that and then if enough of us do that we are like tiny little cells of a vast organism which is the collective farm food ecosystem and indeed the collective human consciousness and our farms will have a big influence a spiritual influence on the other human beings who are not lucky enough to live on farms absolutely you know that's um part of of that story in our version of heaven on earth we're not at war with nature we're actually in harmony with nature and I noticed that I said that we originally were chemical farmers and the whole notion of industrial farming and chemical farming is, is you know, how do I kill that insect or kill that weed? So we're in this constant mental process of being at war with the very planet that actually sustains us. And to me, that's just the, the biggest shift emotionally and spiritually when we come into this regenerative agricultural process is that we're now looking to, to observe and learn from nature. And instead of that question being, how can I kill that insect? And even in a biodynamic method, you know, sometimes we say, can I put a pepper on to stop that insect coming onto my farm? when in fact we should be asking, I wonder why nature has that insect here? Because in, in, 
in this um, natural version of heaven on earth, wouldn't insects be the garbage collectors that take the food that's not balanced and not vibrant enough to go further up the food chain? And so now those insects are actually helping us to be vital and vibrant and healthy. They're not in there trying to stop us making money on our farm. They're actually in there trying to give us a message that we've got something out of balance here. And maybe if we observe that and work with nature, we'll end up with a, a lot better outcome. Well, I completely agree with that. Um, there was a contemporary of Rudolf Steiner, a man called Sir Albert Howard, who was um, sent out to India at the height of the British Empire to teach the Indian farmers in the Hunza Valley, now part of Pakistan, how to farm. And he had the humility to realize when he arrived there that they knew more about farming, sustainable farming, than he did. So he spent 35 years there studying their agriculture and he called the farmers his professors. And more than that, he was a, a, a specialist in plant diseases. He realized that the diseases, as you just said, were there to teach. And he said, we should regard pests, diseases and parasites as nature's professors of good husbandry because they will reveal to us our management deficiencies. So if you have an animal that's got a mastitis or you know, in our case or whatever it is, an affliction or a plant that's got a fungal disease or whatever, then you instead of trying to use what they euphemistically called a, a plant protection product which is actually a poison uh, to suppress the disease we need to think how we can nourish the plant or the animal or the person correctly to restore this balance of positive health so i completely sign up to what you said and i think it's this mindset set shift which is actually required if we're going to get the our relationship with food production right yeah, Patrick, we've actually, in New South Wales, we've been, we've gone through a big mice plague, just following the drought. We've just got mice everywhere. And um, we, you know, on our farm, we put, we planted a multi-species crop of about 20, 26 different seeds. Mm. And um, we actually hopped on the, the four-wheeler uh, two or three weeks ago and we drove it, we, we drive into the crop and it was just, all of these quails flew out. It was full of ladybugs. And we actually didn't have any mice around our, our farm. This is going back, you know, six weeks. But mm. There were, and that whole discussion around diversity and biodiversity is the thing that is, you know, from at a pest level, it's really crucial. And what's happened is that we, we've actually mulched all of that um, multi-species crop back in and we've got mice you know no, nowhere near as as many as because we've still got lots of bird life and that's keeping keeping the mice at bay but out you know what we're seeing around and, and we're not catching anywhere near as many as our neighbors but it's a fascinating sort of discussion around you know how important diversity is and mm -hmm. and protected habitat and all of those things that are crucial absolutely crucial so that's really interesting so what you're saying is that the diversity that you have on your farm has, first of all, protected against the imbalance of the mice uh, plague happening, but then made it more rapid to restore it to equilibrium. So that's really interesting. So is that true playing out everywhere that the predators are gradually building their numbers to bring the mice populations down? Is that happening? Sadly, in a lot of the... the country it's not happening because that uh, that predator um system has been broken so you know when we break the natural cycles then we have to step in physically ourselves and do something to bring it into balance so you know until we regenerate the landscape enough to restore those natural cycles then then uh, you know we we have to reach into our own pocket to deal with it. That's a little bit the same as the, the nutrient cycles. You know, when we break the natural nitrogen cycle, you know, we've got to go to Incitec or the fertiliser company and buy it in a bag. You know, it's a, a much more expensive way to farm and it's also uh, produces pretty poor quality food. So, It is pretty amazing though, Mike. Like, okay, so this mice plague has been really intense, Patrick. I mean, I don't know if you've seen in the YouTube clips, but there are just um, thousands and upon thousands of mice falling out of every 
crevice. It's been destroying crops and every and um. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Brady Halls. Welcome to A Current Affair. First to the mouse plague, wrecking crops and ruining lives. You know, these mice are not just in the paddocks and grain sheds, they're literally eating their way through people's homes. Tonight, incredible videos from the locals living on the front line. Oh, let's go, let's go, let's go. Hurry up, get in line. It's raining mice. Just a mouse problem? I think not. People waking up in their beds and having their body parts chewed on by mice or rats. That gives me the shudders. Hi, my name's uh, Sam. We live just out of Golgong in the central Tablelands, New South Wales. And we are currently going through a really bad mouse plague. Um, it's been going on for at least the last five, six months. It's getting to the point where we want to burn the house down because they are just everywhere. They're using um, this bean, which they have been chewing on. Here they use that as like a ramp to get from outside. They walk across the curtain rod. Got a hole there, you can see. So these are my four boys. Um, we have Bryson, Ashton, Noah and Harry. We worry about the health of the kids you know, because they're in this all the time. They eat anybody food and they eat Fiddy too. And they eat from our bags, put holes in our bags. And and they start climbing on my bed. Alright, so this is our pantry. I know this is absolutely disgusting, but we have just closed it up. Some dead ones on the ground. It stinks so bad. I'm sick of cleaning it. It makes me feel sick. These videos make us look like we are completely feral, but I swear we're not. We just have given up. Numerous times we've just been bitten, whether it be, you know, on the hand, on the leg, um, face. We've actually had them crawl up our tracksuit pants when we've been in bed. One night I had my, my toe eaten. They had actually ripped down into a few layers of my skin. My toes were just bleeding. It was extremely painful. Gave me some pretty bad headaches. Made me feel really, really sick. It amazes me what they can actually do. And I worry about my kids. I pray that nothing bad's gotta happen to them. G'day. Straight from Dunny Do here. How you going? Time of afternoon where I got to go and empty out these bucket traps. So basically, what happens with these traps? We have a ramp set up. The uh, mice run onto here. There's a bit of Nutella. It spins and they fall into the water. I'm catching about average about four to six hundred a night. It takes us three hours to do this usually, and sometimes I'm up two or three times a night rebaiting these. You've got to keep on top of it because Every one of these mice can breed. Um, a young one will breed again in 28 days and probably four to six in a litter. So 100 mice in one month can produce into 6,000 of the buggers. It's unrelenting. Constant day after day. I'm pretty tired at the moment myself. Been loading up a heap of rubbish for the tip. Mice got into a camping bag, fishing bag, ate the guts out of it, made a mess. I'm throwing out a chainsaw safety helmet. Um, mice chewed in my earmuffs and peed all over the place. I'm down my back paddock. Thought I'd show you um, some mouse holes. There's hundreds of them, thousands of them. Last year, this was a thriving bed of cauliflower, cabbage, broccoli, and the mice just chewed it bare. I got crook with encephalitis 13 years ago, uh, ironically from uh, mice. I've never fully recovered. I'm always worried about the side effects, what can happen with me any time. And it's a bit terrifying because it paralysed me on the right side last time and I had to re it took me um, six months to learn to walk again. It's raining mice. 
Oh, you never get used to it. Yeah, it's just a stench. You don't get used to that stench. And in the middle of the night, you hear a lot of scratching in the roof. And I, I know people who always have mice run across their face and not the ideal situation for a good sleep. I know people who have got all their food and eskies and all that just because the mice are getting to it. Like we bait our house a lot. Like, and we've probably spent at least 10 grand worth of bait just spreading it across the paddocks. The other day I opened up my car's bonnet. After I left it there for probably about two days, mice were just falling from the bonnet and just everywhere in my motor. And I was banging the dash and hundreds of mice were just running out of the dash. I'm gonna show you my cupboard that I look at every morning when I get up and every night before I go to bed after I've cleaned it. Mice, devastation everywhere. And yes, there is a dead mouse. This is filmed just up from my place. This was a sunflower crop. This would have been beautiful, lined with yellow, but no, it wasn't the drought, it wasn't too much rain, it was the mice. This is shocking. This is what people have to deal with every single day because of these it's flaming different. vermin. There's no end in sight with these with this mice. Don't know what we're going to do. Until you're living with it every day, I don't think you can fully understand the extent of, of what they do. It's really heartbreaking just to, you know, have to live with this every day. And it doesn't matter what we do, it just keeps going and going and going. What do we do? Keep moving? It's a bit demoralising at times. Got to keep smiling. Got to keep pushing. Yeah. Oh, I don't know how they sleep at night. We're told apart from baiting, what is needed to get rid of the mice is a good soaking of winter rain and a run of frost. If they don't come, locals fear spring and summer will bring an even worse plague. The multi-species seeds have brought the quails and the lady beetles are thriving and the quails have been acting like chickens and eating all the mice, basically. So on the region egg farms, the mice issue is basically completely manageable. Would you agree, Mike and Helen? Like completely comparatively to everyone else around you, it's been a massive, obvious, surprising result of the multi-species flower seeds. Yeah, I think um, when you say it's, it's completely manageable, the, the numbers are a bit overwhelming just for, for anybody. But, um, you yeah, know, at least they're not falling out of the ceiling and, and you know, just scurrying everywhere. And, and it's, there are those numbers relatively close by. So, you know, it is seems like we do have a, you know, a bit of a microclimate here simply because we've been able to manage that biodiversity and keep the the predator cycles working properly yeah how serious is the mice plague to first of all total productivity of farming uh in australia and secondly or wherever the epicenter is in new south wales is it and secondly the uh, economics of individual farmers yeah, it's it's been devastating. I mean, you know, some farmers it's just they've they've lost whole crops to the the mice. Um, you know, we hear stories of people that have had to um, throw whole linen cupboards out because they're they're just you know infested with mice. Um, it really is quite devastating to, to, to those people. And, and there's no easy solution to that, you know. So the government's actually stepped in to, to help the farmers pay for enough bait to, uh, to actually reduce the numbers. Um, and that's really the, the only response we're left with because we've broken those, those natural cycles. So is the... Um the bait of warfarin or a, a rodenticide equ equivalent to that? And do, I, do you know whether that's affecting, because the tragedy of using, as you all know from your past, 
if you use chemical suppressants to deal with pests and diseases, you will further upset the ecosystem. And I'm not arguing against, you know, you, extreme measures are sometimes necessary if you have a, a plague or a pestilence or a pandemic or something. But it's interesting, isn't it, to reflect on the secondary consequences of using these extreme control measures on the whole um, ecosystem. And I wonder what's go what that will be. But is it is it the case that you've lost? I mean, have you lost ten percent of your total food crops, or twenty percent? Or I mean, how bad is it in terms of is it is it affecting what people can buy in the shops, or not really? Um, not really affecting what people can buy in the shops at the moment, because this is happening in the, sort of the west and the interior of New South Wales. So. It's more grain crops and, and cotton and, um, you know, so it may well reflect, if it keeps going, it may well reflect in the in the wheat crop, which would come through the, the shops as higher bread prices. Um, the, the vegetable sides of things are, you know, mostly grown on the coast and so not as impacted by, by this. But, um, you know, so from a societal perspective, the people in the cities are probably not really seeing it, but when you ask about the impact, you know, some farmers have lost a hundred percent of their their income, their production, mm -hmm. and and have to live with within this, you know, horrendous biblical bloody mouse plague. And I think the, I mean the the mouse plague is a symptom of the, mm. the systemic issues that we have, you know, and. The fact that we're not working with nature. I mean, you look at COVID and, you know, we have this discussion around monoculture crops and everyone, all of these plants socially distancing from themselves and getting very sick, you know, and and, <laughs> and if we imagine a diverse, a diverse relationship where the immune system is functioning and healthy, then then COVID wouldn't be an issue, just like, you know, plants that are healthy and thriving, they don't get sick. So the conversation and, and that whole conversation around, uh, you know, a, a, a thriving, abundant nature is exactly how what we, what we need to communicate to foodies and to consumers about how important it is, what they're eating is nutrient dense. And that comes down to the way that farmers farm and the, and the, and the support of of food and 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 support of of organic and regenerative and and eco, what's the what's the word that you in the UK that you use? What was your t term for regenerative agriculture, Patrick? Um, eco ag eco agriculture is yeah, that your eco eco agroecological? It's not a term I use because I think it's just rather hard to say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I think what is interesting about what you say is. The plague of mice in Australia and COVID, what is the relationship? Discuss. And I think you're absolutely right to say that when something gets out of balance, there is a sort of Gaian response. Gaia mm. being this, you know, idea that the, the earth or the earth system has a collective intelligence. And if things are put out of balance, there will be a restoration and equilibrium will be restored, but not necessarily in a way which is friendly to human come lately to human beings who populate the planet or indeed uh, any other species. So uh, the question is, what can we learn from COVID which would inform better practices in the future? And I think if we could understand that as you say, with nutrition and with farming and having diversity on our farms and with the promotion through nutrition of strong public health, then we will be able to withstand, um, in this case, a disease organism, uh, even though our, initially our immune systems are relatively uh, naive and um, unaccustomed to it and still remain healthy. And of course, once again, with COVID, extreme methods, because we are so out of balance with the planet, extreme methods like lockdown have been necessary. But I do think it's important, whilst we are undergoing whatever we're doing, like in my case, I've had the vaccine. I'm not a great fan of vaccination, but I can see that, you know, you've got to do your bit. 
and you've got to be socially isolated, etc. Actually, we need to be thinking of the underlying causes of COVID. And in the same way, the plague of mice has its own root cause, which is really what we need to be attending to. And as Lady Eve Balfour, uh, the founder of the Soil Association, the organization I used to work for, uh, said in one of her books, instead of treating the symptoms of disease, we should be investigating the causes of health. And the cause of health, of course, goes right back to healthy agriculture and healthy ecosystems and harmony of our relationship with the planet. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And I think that we just need to uh, collaborate as best we can and get this message out to people. Well, Patrick, it's been an absolute... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Mike just muted me while I was <laughs> saying what an absolute pleasure it is to speak with you, Patrick. And I wanted to also share with you one other, one other really wonderful um, campaign that we do every year, and it's called the National Regenerative Agriculture Day. And it's farmers and foodies hijacking Valentine's Day. So I, we would love if you would share with us on the 14th of February, February this sort of explosion of celebrating regenerative agriculture and, and we'd love to collaborate with you on that, Patrick. So thank you for joining us today. It's been just an absolutely wonderful discussion. It's been a delight. Yeah. Well, so I'm, cool. I'm looking forward to celebrating the, the 14th of February in a new way with you. Thank you for that invitation. <laughs> it's been fantastic to talk to you too. Thanks, so Patrick. great. Thank you, Patrick. And um, look, I can't wait to have you and Mike a bit of collabing there, um, talking about the certification processes. So let's um, let's wire and fire a healthy relationship between Australia and Wales. By the way, I am from Hereford in Wales, so I have that connection. And um, okay, our... well, you're only a, 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 maybe an hour and a half where you would have come from only an hour and a half from us. Just drive west. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for um, tuning in with us today. You guys all have a good night or morning wherever you are in the world. And thank you and good night. <laughs> thank you.